Losing the Plot is a series all about examining video game narratives. As you'd expect, there are spoilers everywhere, so if you don't want spoilers for Alan Wake or even other Remedy titles, you might want to skip out now. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed today's video, which is brought to you with the help of Patreon support. I'd always been interested in playing Alan Wake, but it wasn't until earlier this year when I finally got into a position where I was able to that I got to play it for the first time. It's a game that's always appealed as it's about an author trying to survive as his latest horror novel begins coming true around him. It's exactly the kind of weird meta-narrative that appeals to me and my love of the strange and incomprehensible. And the game's story sure is bonkers. There is a straightforward thriller story buried under this weirdness with Alan discovering his wife missing, a whole week gone from his memory and a kidnapper holding him to ransom while dark forces close in. But then it gets progressively weirder. Amnesia, prophetic manuscripts, possessed tractors, and a diving suit man bathed in light that kicks off events by handing the titular protagonist a flashlight in a dream. References to a poet who's simultaneously famous and obscure. Two old men who claim to be Norse gods and write prophetic songs about Alan's situation. And a broken light switch that turns out to be the most important item in the world. The game also doesn't have a proper ending as Alan sees seemingly gets trapped in the darkness, leaves a cryptic final line, and is then told to wake up while David Bowie sings about astronauts. And all the while, Alan collects pages of a manuscript that describes the events that end up happening in the real world moments later. So today we're going to try and make some sense of this. Let's examine Alan Wake and find out exactly what's going on. What makes Alan Wake such an odd experience is that it technically happens on two layers. The first is the game as we play it, as Alan battles through the darkness to try and save his wife and make sense of the horrors playing out around him. The second layer is the manuscript you can collect throughout the game that predicts the game's events ahead of time. I stepped into the gas station's garage. It was dark and quiet. The place was a mess. It looked like someone trashed the place or that there'd been some kind of fight. Light spilled into the room through an open door at the back, and I made my way toward it. Without any warning, I was blinded by a bright light. An old portable TV on the shelf had come alive by itself. Impossibly, I could see myself on the screen, talking like a madman. The manuscript is Wake's next novel, Departure, which he wrote in a week he doesn't remember and is now witnessing it unfold in front of him in the real world. It features him as the protagonist, along with the townsfolk around him as supporting characters. The town is steadily being engulfed by a dark presence that is turning people into mindless killing machines referred to as the Taken. A deranged alcoholic FBI agent has arrived to investigate the disappearance of Alan's wife and the upcoming Deerfest is likely to be disrupted. The presence of the manuscript within the world raises questions about how real the events of the story are, as they've been concocted by Wake ahead of them happening. And it also raises further philosophical questions if the events and even the manuscript actually exist. The manuscript is typically accurate to the real events, so accurate that there's a moment where FBI agent Nightingale, obsessed with the idea of catching Wake, recognises events about to happen because he read about them in the manuscript. Nightingale felt the situation veering out of his control but the gun at least felt steady in his hands. He was ready to fire, resolved that he would let this happen over his dead body. And yet he hesitated. He had seen this moment before, read it in the page. He was transfixed by the deja vu and the horror that he was a character in a story someone had written. Then the monstrous presence burst in behind him and dragged him into the night. But not everything in the game comes from the fiction. The opening of the game, where Wake and his wife Alice arrive in the town of Bright Falls, Washington, isn't in the manuscript, nor is the scene where she is abducted by a creature of the darkness disguised as an old lady in a funeral dress. These things happen without Wake writing them, but the manuscript suggests that Dark Presence needs the manuscript to escape its prison deep within Cauldron Lake, the central natural feature of the town and location of the cabin Wake stayed in to write his novel. The Dark Presence influences Alan's writing, but Alan can outwit it and write his own escape. He can somehow write 
an elaborate story where he faces off against horrors and yet constantly survives, and the Dark Presence doesn't twist this to its own ends. And if everything in the manuscript comes true, then it means that not only does the fiction control the supernatural presence, but it also gives Alan the ability to influence other people to do what he likes, as they play out their part in the story without thought. Trying to wrap your head around it all is enough to make your head hurt. This is where two aspects of the game's world that aren't directly part of the main narrative help to explain what's going on. As you move through Bright Falls, you will encounter TVs that show one of two things. Alan trapped in a cabin trying to write while looking terrified, or episodes of the Twilight Zone homage show, Night Springs. Let's look at the Alan show, shall we? In each of these, we get insights into Alan's thought process as he writes the manuscript that caused all of this. And there are some interesting threads running through his ramblings. A writer is a light that reveals the world of his story from darkness, shapes it from nothingness. The way a sculptor carves a statue from a block of granite. A story is not a machine that does what you tell it. A story is a beast with a life of its own. You can create it, shape it, but as the story grows, it starts wanting things of its own. Change one thing and you set off a chain reaction of events that spreads through the whole thing. The characters have to be true to themselves. The events need to follow a logic that fits the story. A single flaw and the magic is gone. The story must stay true for this to work. There have to be victims along the way. Near escapes, cliffhangers. In a horror story, it can't be certain that the hero will succeed or even survive. He almost has to die. The writer being a light in the darkness is an interesting one because that's literally what he becomes. The story forms itself around him and he's the one pushing towards making an ending. His initial goal is to save his wife, but by the end of the game, Game, his goal becomes finishing the story, writing an ending, and escaping back into reality. There's also the literal interpretation of the darkness being the enemy, and him carrying a flashlight to defeat it. But, in all of this, he knows that there are rules that must be adhered to, and violating them causes the story to fall apart. Characters have to stay true to themselves, because if they are written out of character, then they most likely won't act believably, and everything just falls apart. He's also surprised to find himself writing a horror story, and he knows that he has to follow the rules of the genre outside of what he's used to in his previous works. Bear all of this in mind as we look at some of the Night Springs episodes. If our lives are already written, it would take a courageous man to change the script. All of these episodes follow a central theme, the concept of an objective fixed reality created by someone or something else. An absence of creativity features a man creating a world around him to the confusion of the women in that world. He is the author of that story, struggling with writer's block and failing to put something of note in the basement. He even refers to it as a plot hole, something he needs to resolve, or it all tears apart. The episode about the dreamer talks about the need for the characters to keep the dreamer asleep or else they die within the dream. They don't exist without the person and dreaming them into existence. It's not hard to spot the similarity with fictional characters only existing because of their author, and perhaps this includes several residents of Bright Falls who assist in Wake's story. The moral of the other stories asks questions about free will versus our lives being predetermined, and the nature of how writing horror is a way to bring horrors to life. If you go looking for mythology, it may come looking for you. And such quests always bear fruit. There is a very real chance that all of this points to one explanation. Nothing in Alan Wake is real. The story isn't supposed to represent a real town with real people and a real author running for his life. Instead, the story exists solely as a metaphor. Alan even says at one point, For me, the supernatural had always been nothing but a metaphor for the human psyche. There's a real chance that the whole game exists as a metaphor for its own author, musing on the nature of fiction. That he is Alan Wake. Because in a story where the events are driven by something emerging from a lake, it's easy to glance over at the credits and realise that the writer's name is Sam Lake. The similarities between the names of the real writer and the fictional one are obvious, but Wake showing up on a talk show with Lake himself in a flashback directly puts the writer into the story. Not to mention that Wake's previous work, a series of gritty crime dramas about a hard-boiled cop whose family had been killed, are almost certainly a reference to Max Payne, Remedy's previous title, which not only was written by Sam Lake, but also features his face on the protagonist. His talk show appearance even references this. What's more, do the face for his Sam. 
It's incredibly likely that Alan Wake is not meant to be a literal story, but one where its author is placing himself into the story. It's a way for Sam Lake to express frustration at moving from high tension, high violence action into moody horror. It's adaptation in video game form, where Charlie Kaufman struggled to adapt a book about flowers into a movie, so he wrote a movie about struggling to adapt a book about flowers into a movie. The game even presents itself as episodes of a TV show with distinct end cards and previously seen segments to refresh players at the start. It adds to the layers of unreality and says this is all explicitly fiction. That's it. I've cracked it. I'm onto you like I figured it out. Nothing in Alan Wake is real. None of it was ever real. It's purely metaphorical fiction. It's an allegory. Nothing is real. Of course, that all makes sense, until a looming concrete monolith emerges and undoes that whole theory. Right now we're in control. You probably saw this coming. It's impossible to talk about Alan Wake now without bringing up Remedy's most recent title, Control, a game we previously discussed on this show. The two games initially seem separate, with Control about a woman named Jessie Faden becoming director for a shadowy government agency known as the Federal Bureau of Control, who investigate paranatural happenings. However, that all changes when you find a case file labelled The Bright Fall Summary, a document that describes the events of Alan Wake in detail. We then see visions of Alan Wake in a hidden room, Wake's manuscript is designated an altered item by the FBC, and the game's final DLC expansion, AWE, centres its entire storyline around the FBC's investigation into Bright Falls. In the ending of Alan Wake, we see Alice emerge from the lake with Alan seemingly writing her back to safety, but at the cost of being locked in the lake himself. Alan's whereabouts are still unknown, implying he's still down there. The Bright Falls documents back this up, confirming Alice was found during the Bureau's investigation with Alan, Agent Nightingale, and a psychiatrist Alan encountered named Dr. Hartman all still missing. In the AWE DLC, we also find interviews with Alice confirming the existence of the mysterious Mr. Scratch who shows up without explanation in the ending as he has been badgering Alice. There is a case file entitled The Shadow, which appears to be the FBC's designation for the Dark Presence from Cauldron Lake. And most notably, the DLC revolves around stopping Dr. Hartman, currently held in captivity in the oldest house, from escaping into the Bureau at large. Turns out, Hartman's fate was not a pleasant one. After Alan imprisoned him in a room with the Dark Presence during the original game, we never saw him again, but when the FBC arrived, they found Hartman at the lodge, changed into a Taken. The Bureau apprehended him and returned him to the oldest house for containment and study. And then the Hiss arrived. The Hiss is Control's equivalent to the Dark Presence, an all-consuming force that turns people into monsters. It infected Hartman, turning him into an even more corrupted creature, no longer resembling his old self, and Jesse has to suppress him. Dr. Emile Hartman. Devoured by hungry darkness, became the thing that had been Hartman. Broke loose, killed everyone it could, lurking, roaming, waiting. Then something else came, a resonance. The thing that had been Hartman went through another change. The third thing, the sound made darker, the darkness made louder. Hartman was stretched like a worm through time. But the connections don't end there. There's one odd plot point left unanswered in Alan Wake. When Alan is accompanied by Sheriff Breaker as they move to the power plant, she tells Wake's agent to call a list of people, including the radio DJ Pat Main and her dad, Frank. Here's a list of people and phone numbers. I need you to call them and tell them you have a message from me. Night Springs, okay? They'll know what to do. Night Springs? Like the TV show? Gotcha. Oh, hey, that radio guy is on the list, Main. Who's Frank Breaker? He related to you? My dad. Hey, is this like a secret society? All we learn about Frank Breaker beyond this is Sarah describing his former life in New York. I guess you New Yorkers are used to rough situations like this. Right, the city's a war 
Warzone, King Kong, Mutant Alligators, and Alex Casey shoots the place up every weekend. Look, I never even carried a gun until a couple of days ago. Well, my dad used to be a cop there. Tell some pretty wild stories. Frank's identity is otherwise a complete mystery, and it's not clear why it's so important to contact him with the supernatural activity going on. In Control's documents, we learn that he was an FBC agent before he moved to Bright Falls and became sheriff. Perhaps this is what Sarah meant by a cop in New York who'd seen crazy things. He was also directly involved in previous incidents in Bright Falls, with further documents expanding on an incident involving Odin and Tor Anderson, two brothers in a rock band who we encounter as senile patients in Hartman's Lodge in Alan Wake. This rock band also connects to Control. The sequence in Alan Wake where you reach the Anderson farm and defeat a bunch of Taken on an old stage while one of their tracks rocks out in the background is repeated in Control when Jesse enters the ashtray maze and another of their tracks blasts out as you navigate the twisting corridors, fighting off the hiss. However, apparently Alan is also writing all of this too. At the start of the AWE DLC, we see Alan writing about Jesse, guiding her to find Dr. Hartman and take him down. Darkness engulfed the elevator. There was something there, reaching for her, trying to make her act. It was a distress call. Faden sensed a drowning man, a hunger in the dark. Investigation sector. Investigation sector, huh? He also shows up elsewhere writing about his attempts to escape. I used to know where fiction ends and reality begins. Here, they're all the same. It's a hideous trap my every thought made real. Fear, desire. How can I ever know for sure I've escaped and not just lost in my own fantasy of it? That thought alone can drive you insane. It's led to theories that every event of control was also penned by Wake, and therefore fits the wider fiction he's concocted in the lake. It doesn't help that an old script for Night Springs penned by Alan is very explicitly about the FBC, and quite possibly about the events that led to the previous director's downfall at the hands of the Hiss. Apparently, Alan Wake created the Bureau too. Certainly fits if everything is an allegory for Sam Lake himself, who still is very much sitting at that writing desk. But this kind of falls apart when you realise these elements were on the fringe of Control's main story. Aside from these isolated incidents, nowhere in Control's story does it suggest that the events are anything but the canonical reality of its universe. Which means they happened, meaning the events of Alan Wake also happened, or else the FBC wouldn't have conducted investigations into them. But how can that be? How does any of this begin to make sense? Fair warning. This is going to be weirder than usual. The events of Alan Wake were an example of supernatural events spreading into our world. The Federal Bureau of Control has an official designation for these occurrences, Altered World Events. They can be small scale, creating an object with supernatural properties, designated altered items or objects of power depending on their severity. A teleporting duck is an altered item because its effects are minor, a floppy disk that imbues its holder with the power of telekinesis would be an object of power. Altered World Events can also be on a larger scale, with notable examples including an incident in Jasper Crossing, Arizona, where residents of the town became paralyzed as a result of a post box, an incident where a space team returned with an extra astronaut, and a slide projector found in the dump of the small town of Ordinary that led to a corrupting resonance escaping into our world and acting as the catalyst for the entire storyline of Control. Bright Falls is also designated an AWE, and two items from Alan Wake are also designated altered items due to their exposure to or involvement in creating the incident. The collectible coffee thermoses found throughout the game are an altered item, promising to always deliver the perfect coffee at the perfect temperature at any time. It may also be why Alan keeps finding them in random places, because the item just knows the man needs coffee. Rusty here is no longer human. Nothing but black coffee under a thin layer of skin. 
Yeah, that makes two of us. See, there's a purpose to them now. They're not just a random collectible for the sake of adding a collectible. The other more important altered item is the manuscript itself. While it appears that the FBC don't have the full manuscript, since Alan presumably still has this under Cauldron Lake, they do have a supplementary page about him attempting to write his own escape. It was handed to the FBC via a door in the trans-dimensional motel the FBC used for transport, which is its own discussion that I'll get to later. The typewritten page exhibits supernatural effects on its reader, giving them a sense of dislocation, as if witnessing the page being written as you read it, and as if reality around you was being to match the words on the page. If we apply this to the manuscript as a whole, it's possible that Nightingale got so distressed by reading about his own actions it led him to get more aggressive out of fear as a result of this dislocation. The manuscript clearly is shaping reality around itself and quite possibly is leading people to act in a certain way, but rather than mind control, it's nudging the characters in the story and for them to act otherwise causes them distress. But how did Alan create the manuscript in the first place? That's simple. If altered items are the collective unconscious powering these items with our thoughts, it stands to reason that an author might be able to create a text that alters reality to match itself. As a writer, imagination is his trade, which is even stated explicitly in the game. And if the collective unconscious can create vampiric scissors or creepy mirror worlds, an author's imagination bringing a dark force to life is perfectly reasonable. Especially because he's not the only creator to bring the same effects to life. The FBC notes that the Bright Falls incident of 2010 is not the first time that it happened, as Thomas Zane and the Anderson brothers in the 1970s also created their own altered world events. Thomas Zane is the most notable of these, as his actions led to knock-on effects that shaped Alan Wake's story. A poet by trade, Zane stayed in the same cabin as Wake, and was encouraged by the same dark presence to write poems to bring back his lost love. He did manage to bring back his girlfriend, but she had become a vessel for the dark presence and no longer the Barbara Jagger that he knew and loved. Realising what he had done, he wrote himself and the cabin out of existence as he dove into the lake wearing a diving suit. He is mentioned in passing by Wake's agent early in the game with some references to his name in the town's records, but no record of his poetry or career. He also shows up to Wake throughout the game as a bright light, guiding him, helping him escape the cabin in the first place, and leaving him items that help him combat the darkness. Wake seemingly writes him back into existence through his fiction as a deity of light, although as we'll get to, that may be too simple a reading. After Zane's disappearance, the Anderson brothers, singer and guitarist for the band Old Gods of Asgard, created songs that contained prophecy and supernatural knowledge they couldn't possibly have known about. They wrote about the previous Altered World event involving Thomas Zane, and left a message for Alan Wake that was essential for his journey. while also writing a song about Wake's specific plight in Children of the Elder God, a song that blasts out in one of the most enjoyable encounters in the game. <laughs> that was awesome! But then their lyrics stretch even further out into the Remedy verse, as spin-off title American Nightmare featured the song Balance Slays the Demon, another song that relates specifically to the events of the game it's from, and features a backwards message after its big solo. Yeah, they also wrote Take Control, the prophetic song that plays and controls Ashtray Maze, and relates to Jesse Faden's story and doesn't touch on the events in Bright Falls at all. In the video on Control, I used my limited knowledge reading upon Alan Wake to determine that Odin and Tor literally were their namesakes from Norse mythology. Now seen Alan living on a farm in Washington state, tying in with the janitor of the oldest house seemingly being a Finnish sea god. But it seems I've read them all wrong. The band's imagery was intentionally based on Norse mythology, and they changed their names to reflect the gods. The fact that they're so obviously aged and suffering from dementia does some work in undoing them as immortal deities, but that doesn't mean they don't have powers 
as evidenced by their songs and Tor's ability to seemingly control storms. There's another explanation, something that ties Wake, Zane, the Andersons and Faden all together in a very direct way. Faden is the director of the FBC, a position she receives upon finding the previous director seemingly having killed himself and picking up his gun. The gun provides a line to the astral plane and the board who assign the directorship on their assessment of the individual holding the service weapon. In order to survive this assessment, the FBC have determined that the individual must be a para-utilitarian, someone with an innate affinity for the supernatural. Faden is absolutely this type of person, as her interactions with the Bureau's objects of power grant her the power of telekinesis, teleportation and flight. She holds a benevolent supernatural force in her brain that guides her and grants her healing powers, and she receives visions of the former director and others from time to time, including Wake himself on a couple of occasions. It's no wonder that she was considered as part of the Bureau's prime candidate program, designed to find para-utilitarians suitable for the role of director. But she wasn't the only one, as Wake himself is listed as a potential candidate in the Bright Falls file. And this is where things get interesting. If Wake is a para-utilitarian, that explains a lot. It also pins Zane and the Andersons as para-utilitarians too, a theory that makes more and more sense as you look into this. Since Altered World events seem to be the trigger for para-utilitarians to awaken to their powers, it's possible that Cauldron Lake, or possibly the entire town of Bright Falls, awoke their powers or enhanced their abilities in some way. After all, the three parties were drawn to the town and all three wrote supernatural works that affected reality, but the thing to note about all of them is that they all seem to be aware of each other as para-utilitarians on an instinctive level and they may share a telepathic link. Because here's why it feels wrong to say Wake wrote Zane back into existence. They first meet in a dream where Wake flees the Dark Presence before he ever sits down at a typewriter, and Zane's books seem to hold the significance for Wake as soon as he sees them in the cabin. He's also able to sense that Zane is the being of light without needing to be informed of this in any other way. He just knows. The Andersons see Wake in a diner early on and attract his attention immediately. Odin seems determined to speak to Wake and bond over a song. When they meet again in Hartman's Lodge, the two of them seem to see through their dementia-ridden mental fog and do their best to communicate to Wake that he can do something about the darkness. They seem much keener to speak to Wake than they do other characters and are quick to offer him knowledge. Wake himself writes about Faden while trapped in Cauldron Lake, guiding her to stop Hartman while also trying to use the FBC as his escape route. It's quite possibly him who finds a way to set off the alert at the end of the AWE DLC, using this as a way to get agents on the scene who could help him leave the lake. And yet he shouldn't know about the FBC. While he is from New York where the oldest house is found, it also remains hidden in plain sight so the chances of him knowing about it are minimal. Unless his para-utilitarian abilities means he can sense it, and possibly can sense Faden herself even when he's trapped in the lake. Meanwhile, Faden is aware of Zane's poetry. While Zane wrote himself and his work out of existence, she is still aware of one of his poems which she talks about in a therapy session. Yes. Beyond the shadow you settle for, there's a miracle illuminated. The therapist says there is no poet called Thomas Zane, indicating he was successful in writing his own non-existence, but perhaps other para-utilitarians can still sense each other even through supernatural barriers. She later dismisses it when she sees a vision of Wake and Zane in the Ocean View Motel, but it's clear her mind won't let her forget him being a poet. And Thomas Zane was with him. The poet. No, wait, d d he was a filmmaker. I, I always remember that wrong. And of course, the Anderson songs all point to this ability, having written about Zane, Wake, and Faden, which further adds to the theory that these para-utilitarian abilities transcend time and space, providing their users with the ability to see potential futures or influence events in the past. Aside from the Old Gods of Asgard songs, Alan Wake wrote an early script for Night Springs about the FBC, and Zane was able to write a page for Wake's story about events that happened before Wake was even a writer. This perhaps explains Wake's ability to rewrite reality. Perhaps he's not rewriting it, but instead predicting 
predicting possible events, steering the universe's course in that direction, giving the appearance of manipulating reality, when in fact he's merely pushing one specific multiverse to collide with our own. While planning out an episode of Night Springs, his innate paranatural abilities could allow him to see a vision of Director Trench letting the hiss into the Bureau, and thinks it's merely a story idea that he's concocted, and not a vision of something set to happen at least 10 years in the future. Wake's influence is certainly present in how reality shifts, as so much of it connects with pop culture references that he would appreciate, most notably a scene that he describes as being like Nicholson in The Shining, playing out almost shot for shot like, well, Nicholson in The Shining. But this doesn't mean he created it, he's merely influencing it, and this is causing other fiction to become real as he references it in his own writing. Nothing in Alan Wake was created by him. Instead, the Dark Presence manipulated his innate paranatural leanings to steer reality towards an outcome beneficial to itself. It showed up in his dreams before he wrote about it. It manipulated events to get Wake to the cabin and stole his wife before he wrote about it. Because that's the other part of the puzzle here. It's not just the para-utilitarians who were to blame. Cauldron Lake is the epicenter of Alan Wake's story. Wake, Zane, and the Andersons all wrote their works in Birdleg Cabin on the island on the lake, and all of them were influenced by the Dark Presence that resides within its waters. We don't know much about the Dark Presence, and even the FBC's file on it shows more research needs to be done on it. They're aware of how it manifests and how to defend against it, but they aren't really sure what it is. They theorize a hive mind type intelligence and write a further study required on how to combat it, but beyond that, they're as clueless as Wake. Do you have a flashlight? No. Uh, a lantern? Headlamp? Oh, yeah, flare gun. Oh, Christmas lights. You could wrap them around your- I don't have any of those, Langston. But we can piece together some things about its nature. It's bound to the lake and needs assistance in emerging. It does this in two ways. One is direct possession, which we see in Alan Wake's Taken enemies, ordinary people taken over by darkness and turning to violent behavior while nonsensically repeating phrases from within the subject's mind. The second way is luring creative para-utilitarians to the cabin sitting on top of its epicenter and manipulating them into writing it into greater existence. We also learn that its powers require balance and that it can bring something to these authors in exchange for power. Zane willfully uses this power to bring back his girlfriend, but the Dark Presence uses her as a vessel, and it holds Alice Wake hostage in an attempt to get Alan to give it greater power. Alan also learns that it can return Alice, but he has to seal himself in the lake as an exchange. There's also some more obscure references about the nature of the lake and the Dark Presence. Zane's poem described the lake as a mirror for a cosmic horror in the sky, while Wake cryptically refers to the lake as an ocean, something only expanded on in DLC and American Nightmare, as the world inside the lake is a strange, shadowy dimension that Wake can manipulate at will. The lake's weirdness is also common knowledge, as expressed by Barry partway through the game. This place is crazy! Disappearances, mysterious deaths, urban legends come true, and, get this, most of this stuff takes place around Cauldron Lake. Well, you ain't wrong, mister. The Indians thought the lake was a doorway to the underworld. But once again, Control gives us more info about what it can be. In Control, there are places known as thresholds, where other dimensions collide with ours. We encounter a few of these as we progress, with one of the most notable of these being the Quarry, a mining site full of an alien material, a distant unknown city, and a starry night sky that shouldn't exist in the walls of the oldest house. Another threshold is the one created by the Slide Projector Object of Power, a dimension that contains a vast desert, five pillars layered like a crude, outstretched hand, and a malevolent resonance known only as the Hiss. The Hiss is a lot like the Dark Presence, an unknowable malevolent force that possesses people. And just like Wake was able to prevent the darkness from possessing him through his writing, Faden is able to resist the Hiss's power due to her own paranatural abilities. Just like the slide projector world is a threshold containing a malevolent force, so too is Cauldron Lake. This is what Wake means by It's an ocean. 
It's a portal to a dark dimension that magnifies paranatural abilities, allowing creative people sensitive to these forces to write works that manipulate reality. Evidence for this exists in both games, as both Cauldron Lake and The Oldest House, the FBC's bizarre reality-shifting HQ, are referred to by the same terms in both games. Built the farm close to the lake, a place of power. It's a, a place of power, an ongoing AWE of its own. Further connecting these two, if Cauldron Lake is able to take Alan's writing and manipulate reality into following it, the Oldest House also warps reality in a similar manner, changing the director's portrait throughout the building from trench to fade and as soon as she becomes director, and her nickname of the Hiss becomes the Bureau's official designation as soon as she says it to a colleague. And just like that, my name for it is official. Cauldron Lake also connects to the Oldest House, not directly, but via a conduit. Throughout Control, you encounter a place known as the Ocean View Motel, a hub of sorts that Jesse uses as a form of transportation. The FBC aren't clear on its origins or how it works, but they do recognise it as a kind of interdimensional walkway connecting different bits of reality together. Normally, we only ever travel through one door in this building, the one marked with an inverted triangle representative of the mysterious board. But there are a number of other doors and no one is clear where they connect to. Except for one. There's a door marked with a spiral that wakes typewritten page emerge from underneath, and in the AWE DLC, Jesse sees visions of Wake and Zane through this door. Clearly this door connects to Cauldron Lake, or more specifically the shadowy dimension that lurks beneath its surface, the dimension that Wake has been trapped in for 10 years. And let's not forget, if it's an ocean, it stands to reason that it might connect to a place called the Ocean View. There's also one more piece to this puzzle, that expands on all these theories and brings us towards the game's conclusion. Wake creates another altered item through his story, an item known as the Clicker. It's little more than a disconnected light switch, but it was given to him as a child by the father he didn't know. As a child, he applied mythical properties to it because of how mysterious his father was to him, and as an adult, he brings it back to fight off the Dark Presence on its own turf. Because while Wake attributes this to childhood magic, the FBC research on altered items says that imagination and strong thoughts can apply supernatural abilities to otherwise normal items. Wake applies faith that the item was going to protect him from the darkness, and as a result, it did. And it will probably do the same for others now that the effect has been applied and altered the item. And the only reason the FBC don't have it on file is because it too is hidden under the lake. With all this evidence on display, it's easy to make sense of what's happening in Alan Wake. An author with latent supernatural sensitivity is drawn to the town of Bright Falls, Washington, which houses a place of power, a threshold that connects to a dimension housing an eldritch entity trying to encroach on our world. This entity lures Wake closer, pushing him to the wrong cabin and kidnapping his wife. The powers of this entity combine with the author's supernatural abilities to create a manuscript that can manipulate reality in a direction favourable to the entity. But Wake's powers also allow him to break the hypnotic trance the entity seemingly puts him under, and he changes the story to grant him an escape, protect him from the wrath of the entity back in our dimension, and manipulate events to allow him to create a defensive item using paranatural abilities and succeed. He writes an ending when he reaches the cabin and realises that he's now trapped, but there's no logical ending he could write that would just eradicate the darkness and allow him to return home. He has to write in the rules, and the manuscript can't just magic the darkness away. It has to be defeated in a logical way. But as it's an entity that operates on the logic of an alternate dimension, there's no way to know how to battle it to write a satisfactory ending, and so ends his story, and the game itself, on a cliffhanger. It's not a lake. It's an ocean. So what does all this mean? I wish I had an answer to that. Control has helped clarify a lot of what's going on in Alan Wake, but there are still questions. We still don't really understand Wake's double, Mr. Scratch, who is mentioned in FBC documents and is the focus of American Nightmare. Zane may also have a double in the form of a European filmmaker, considering how often this comes up in Control. Alex Casey apparently has become real, or perhaps has been sensed by Wake while writing his original novels and divined the name from the real man. This is also vague and unexplained. There are no concrete answers to what any of this means, and we probably won't get those 
those answers for a while. We also know the Dark Presence is making another push for the surface, although it's a few years away, but the early warning gives the FPC a possible route to rescue Wake from his imprisonment. Remedy have confirmed two more games in development, and one of them is likely to be another story in this shared universe, while the other is almost certainly Alan Wake 2, and hopefully those will shed some more light. No pun intended. But how does Quantum Break fit into all of this, if it does at all? And will the upcoming Crossfire X suddenly swerve from being a workhorse campaign for an unrelated military shooter into a supernatural mystery that connects to everything we've seen so far? I mean, no, but I'd laugh if it did somehow. But let's bring this back to Alan Wake itself. What does it mean? What does it stand for, if anything? Well, quite possibly, nothing. Stephen King once wrote that nightmares exist outside of logic, and there's little fun to be had in explanations. They're antithetical to the poetry of fear. In a horror story, the victim keeps asking why, but there can be no explanation, and there shouldn't be one. The unanswered mystery is what stays with us the longest and it's what we'll remember in the end. Ultimately, if Alan Wake is about anything, it's about stories themselves. It's about the nature of fiction and its ability to shape the world. It's about the nature of writing and how it can run away from the creator in unexpected ways. And how in stories, anything can happen. But it also shows the frustrations of writing, the darkness that can seep in when you're struggling for ideas yet still under pressure from agents and editors to follow up on your greatest creations. And appropriately for this series, it shows the power of storytelling. Alan Wake's creativity is a superpower of sorts, one that wasn't understood until the files of the FBC reached the public eye almost 10 years later. But as we've seen elsewhere in this series, that creative superpower can be used for so many other purposes. In the last episode, I showed how fiction can create horror to offer catharsis and a process by which we can examine our fears in a safe environment. But beyond that, fiction can shape us in other ways. We can see how it's possible to create community in dark times and find something to keep fighting for even when all else feels hopeless. But it can also look at how that drive to fight can be poisoned with factionalism and the consequences of defending those factions at all costs. It can explore relationships in all their ups and downs and how it's possible to reconcile a dispute with mutual understanding and respect. It can help us understand ourselves and figure out conflicts within our own minds. And it can explore how we can overcome trauma and become the person that we're supposed to be. Or you know, they can just entertain us and make us laugh. The many ways that a story can affect the world show that perhaps Alan Wake affecting reality isn't too far off why we tell stories in the first place. It's why I made this series, to show how games can be part of that and how they can tell stories in so many meaningful ways. We've come to the end of the first year of Losing the Plot, and I hope you've enjoyed the journey so far. And just like how the mysteries of Remedy's shared universe have yet to be fully explored, this series has so many more games to study in future. Make sure that you're subscribed to catch future episodes, and likes, Patreon donations, and just simply telling your friends about all this will help improve the show for the future. And on that note, thank you for watching, and I will see you again soon.